It's been a long day, but I think also a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, different cases uh, have been uh, brought to our attention. And I think this is a great thing about uh, a panel like this and being together uh, like this. Uh, for me, I mean, to thank Asia Society, Kelly and Boy, um, for having me here. The importance for someone coming from uh, Latin America, as I do, and to be able to be here uh, two days uh, listening to all of you, it's really a, a privilege. No? Uh, a lot of time we stay uh, centered in our own regions. No? We, we talk a lot with the people that speak our language, that share our same histories, but it's very rare that we do this uh, South-South uh, uh, connections. And I think uh, I really need to congratulate Asia Society for, for taking this initiative and bringing other people into the dialogue. No, I mean, uh, hearing the experience of Ukraine just now was uh, totally uh, like mind-blowing, and as well as many other different uh, cases that uh, that we heard uh, today uh, and that we will continue seeing uh, I will 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 hear uh, the case from uh, the source of museum from from Beirut so so making uh, I mean I want to make this emphasis on on the importance of making these connections no on learning uh, from each other on um, on finding that maybe some of our problems are very similar and maybe some others not and uh, that the different ways we approach them and the solutions that we find are ways of also learning and uh, learning from each other no that that each case has its own particularity but also there's uh, similarities no and i think this is the great thing about having this shared uh, space uh, of thought and exchange of ideas um, i'm going to present my two speakers uh, and then they'll come and speak uh, Hopefully we have enough time. I also prepared a mini presentation, so we'll see if we have time uh, that I show that afterwards, because I thought if I'm already here, I think it's good also to show you a little bit of what I've been doing and thinking, and, and how I've been thinking the idea of, uh, of collections and how, how collections can change institutions and maybe institutions change our societies. No? So, so really the idea of collections being the, the kind of the heart and the DNA of, the, of our institutions. But, uh, but they can only uh, change society if we keep these collections alive, you know? So, so I think this is something that we'll continue addressing uh, when we sit down. Uh, the power of these objects or non-objects uh, to transform uh, society. I'll introduce my two, uh, my two fellow uh, panelists. Um, I have their biographies here, let me... Da, 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 da. Dr. Savyashi Mukherjee, <laughs> Director General of the Shapatri Shivaji Maharaj Batsu Shangralaya Museum in Mumbai, previously, no, previously known as the Prince of Wales Museum, no? Prince, Museum Prince of Wales Museum of Western India. So, so thanks God uh, the name has changed. Uh, no? uh, He's the Director General of the Museum, the Director of the Postgraduate Program in Museology and Art Conservation at the Institute, University of, uh, of Mumbai. Under his leadership, CSMVS has undergone extensive modernization, including renovation of the main building and establishment of the Conservation Center. In 2010, UNESCO recognized his accomplishments with the Asia Pacific Heritage Award for Cultural Heritage Conservation. He has organized numerous art exhibitions and overseen publications, as well as conservation and archival projects in partnership with museums worldwide. A frequent lecturer and member of many professional committees, including the Bistot Group of International Museum Directors, he's a fellow of the Nehru Trust for the Indian Collections at the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Salzburg Global Se Seminar. He received a special jury mention award from the Bombay Management Association for his con contribution to the preservation of Indian culture. The University of Edinburgh awarded him an honorary doctorate degree for transforming CSNBC into a cultural catalyst in Mumbai. And our other uh, guest speaker today is going to be Jasmine Chemali, head of collections at the Sursuk uh, Museum in Beirut. She has been head uh, of collections for modern and contemporary art at the museum since 2014. In 2011, she took charge of the Fouad Devas collection in Beirut, a unique collection of nearly 30,000 images from the Middle East between 1830 and the 1960, which is a subject of this uh, subject of three Sursuk Museum exhibitions annually and of various research projects. Having been trained in conservation at the Col de Louvre in Paris and specializing in Islamic arts, Chemali focuses focuses on the preventive conservation of the objects in her care and ensuring their accessibility to the general public. So um, 
We'll start with Dr. Mukherjee, who promised to speak. Uh, he would take 15 minutes. Uh, I'll count them uh, to help him uh, stay on time. <laughs> and they will continue with, uh, with Jasmine. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, Asia Society, for the opportunity. I have decided not to talk much about my institute. Uh, of course, you know, I'm going to refer a little bit. But the, my, my whole emphasis will be on the relationship between object and the museum. Uh, since yesterday, I have been listening to experts, museum professionals, art historians, and trying to capture some of the, some of the issues, major issues, uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, you know, experts expressing concerns, analog versus digital thinking, on-site experience versus online experience, freedom versus constraints, History versus contemporary history, it's, it's, a, it's a major issue, history versus contemporary history. Container versus platform, new audience for new kind of art. Pull over push. How we are, how we are going to sustain the time, the time specific disruption, this is the question. We do not, we really do not have answer, but it is also true that the core objective of a public museum is education and communication, and that is evolving with time. In the context of Asian museums, it is more like act local, think global. Maintaining the equilibrium between changing metaphors and static values. That is something we have been following in our institute. There is a beautiful museum in Mumbai. The history of the museum is as exciting as the history of Mumbai. Mumbai, perhaps one of the cities or the city in the country was built by the people. Similarly, the museum, uh, it's a very big complicated name, as complicated as my name. Uh, it was given, it was given in two, 2001, formerly Prince of Wales Museum. It was built by the people for the people. In 1904, eminent citizens, a group of eminent citizens got together at the Asiatic, Royal Asiatic Society Bombay, the present Asiatic Society Library, and expressed their desire to have cultural space in the city. They approached the Bombay Presidency. Bombay Presidency agreed to provide a piece of land with condition the citizens should be in position to contribute for the construction of the building and should be in position to maintain it. And for your information, till date, I really don't know. I say, you know, one of the few institutes, one of the largest cultural institutes in the country supported by the people of Mumbai, not by the government. Our establishment cost, salary, not a single penny coming from the government. So this is a rare example, public-private partnership, and the institute is expanding with the time. Building was, building was constructed in 1909, by a Scottish architect, uh, George Whitted. One of the finest examples of Indo-Saracenic style. Indo-Saracenic style combines Islamic and Western architectural elements, but in the case of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Shangrahalaya, formerly Prince of Wales Museum, you get to see all five important architectural elements of all five major Indian religions. Element from Buddhist architecture, element from Hindu architecture, element from Jain architecture, element from Islamic architecture, and elements from Western architecture, a true symbol of cultural unity. Look at the group and think, who are they? Where are they from? 
What do they intend to do? Where are they moving to? What do they want to learn and understand? Why do they come back again and again? These are the questions come in my mind when, when I look at a group approaching the museum building. But the answer is very simple. They are our future. The 21st century internet generation, because they were born in the first half of 21st century and blessed with technology. Representing multi multilingual, multicultural society. Surprisingly, they are disciplined and determined to contribute in the development of museum by purchasing entry tickets. Probably they come again and again just to understand the relevance of the past in the present and also to find solution to some of the contemporary issues. Like ma many others, they are also seeking experience that are authentic and personalized. Neil McGregor, the former director of the British Museum, described, I quote, the whole point about museums is that they help you to sort out your place in the world. It is in a museum that you can look at your own past and think about your relation to it. This is more important now than it has been for a long time. As the world gets more global and the history of identity goes more gets more complicated. It is important to have places where everyone can come and look at themselves, their history, their stories, and future." Unquote. Before we discuss about collections and changing collecting practices in a museum, I think we need to understand the whole concept of collection and its collaborative relationship with the concept of museum. And to be honest with you, the other day, I was looking at the museum building and looking at antiquities in the museum, the collection in the museum. And this is probably one of the, again, one of the few museums where you get to see one, one, one thousand, I think one and a half million years old history from the prehistory to contemporary history. Except the museum building, for your information, except the museum building. Museum building was built for the purpose. The purpose was museum creating cultural space. None of the exhibits, none of the objects were meant for the museum. And that is something we have to understand. Then what is the relationship between object and the museum and the museum space? According to many, collection is a group of objects made of different materials we call tangible, and countless traditions and conventions we call intangible heritage, sourced from, sourced from past and the present, directly or indirectly linked to human creativity, history, religion, politics, crafts, conflicts, nature, and its surrounding, which take us back to that particular time frame and reveal their fascinating stories. They are more like migrants seeking world attention, moving from place to place for shelter and protection. Why do museums acquire objects which are not meant for the museum? Do we have any answer? Each object is made for a particular purpose and, geographic, and geographical location. And then would it be ethically, ethically correct to confine them in a place or building with whom they have no connection? Look at uh, the stupa, Kajudaru stupa in Mirpurkhas. When you visit the CSMBS, you find a gallery dedicated to Buddhist art highlighting Mirpur, Mirpurkhas art. And the label, you, you need to, I, you need to identify the identity of the object. It, it, in, in 2019, it says, Mirpur Khas, Sindh, Pakistan, and then we write CSMBS Mumbai. The stupa was excavated by Sir Henry Cousin in 1909. A part of the collection was shifted to then formerly Prince of, Prince of Wales Museum of Western India. And the stupa was left like this up to the plinth life, plinth level. 
and it was intact until 2012. And then all of a sudden, you know, in 2012, I received a kind of picture from one of the architects from Mirpurkas telling me that the site has been flattened. So there is nothing on the site. So you see the collection in the museum, about 222 fragments of Mirpurka stupa. So the question of confinement of cultural fragments in a museum is a bigger issue in today's world than the 20th century. Now we need to understand more than before about collections collaborative relationship. I repeat once again about collections collaborative relationship with the museum in right perspective. My idea is not to endorse repatriation. Let us understand the collaborative relationship. What is the museum then? What role does it play in contemporary society? Museums are like permanent rehabilitation center. That is the way you know I try to describe, where both tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment are being conserved and protected from conflict and calamities. Similarly, what objects return to you, that is also something you need to understand. Collaboration is always, you know, give and take. Objects representing varied cultures provide opportunity to people from diverse countries and cultures to become partners in the world narrative. Become partners in the world narrative and to motivate them to reclaim the reposition, their own unique regional, national, and global identities in the changing cultural landscape of the world. So the Mirpurkas collection in the museum, it is still described, Kajudaro, Mirpurkas, Sindh district, Pakistan, northwest part of Pakistan, CSMBS, Mumbai. Similarly, when you visit British Museum and look at Amravati collection in the British Museum, it says, South India, Amravati, South India, India, UK, British Museum. So my question, you know, if object can carry multiple identities, why not we? What is the problem? So that is, that is something we need to understand. So this is a true collaborative relationship, a new way of developing relationships between objects, institutes, and individuals. Just show you another experiment we did uh, at the CSMBS in collaboration with the British Museum, uh, India and the World, a history, nine stories. Uh, for the first time in the history of Indian museum movement, 28 Indian museums participated in the exhibition. For your information, it is much easier to bring exhibition from abroad, but it's very, very difficult <laughs> to borrow objects from our own museums. <clears throat> the collaborative exhibition, India and the World, a history in nine stories, was a conversation between objects, cultures, religions, and human minds. The catalyst for each conversation was a specific moment in history, repositioning the Indian objects in the global context and exploring connections between India and the rest of the world. The concept highlighted the iconic moments in India's history from the prehistoric time to the present against the backdrop of comparable happenings in other parts of the world at the same time. None of the universities in the country or none of the colleges teaching about comparative history. So how do, how do we understand when Indus Valley people Excuse me, when Indus Valley people, they were, you know, they were building towns, cities. What was happening in Mesopotamia? What was happening in Egypt? Egyptians, they were building pyramids. How the concept of urban cu culture developed? How do we know that if we don't do the comparative studies? Many of us, many, many of us don't know when the art of writing was invented in India 
On many forums, I asked when the art of writing was invented in India, there was a silence. And many people there, you know, uh, under a kind of uh, illusion that uh, enlightenment, uh, and enlightenment in India started on arrival of Europeans, which is absolutely wrong. The enlightenment in India started with the art of writing, and the art of writing tradition in India, it goes back to Indus Valley civilization. Harappans, they recorded their history. And there are plenty of inscriptions. Unfortunately, we are not in position to decipher. Egyptian scripts, we deciphered. Mesopotamians, we deciphered, but we could not decipher. But they knew the art of writing. And that is something we need to know. We need to understand. And we also need to understand the concept of nation. There was a section, empire, how it all started. When it started in India, and what was happening in Rome, what was happening in Europe and other countries, in China. And British Museum, they provided that world context. For the first time in the history of museum, Indian museum movement, people got to see the comparative history in India and the world. As usual, our histories are glorious. I was listening to many of them, glorious, painful, and surprising. It's not now. That, that, that's the history. Our history was glorious, painful, and surprising. Our history is glor glorious, painful, and surprising. Now, more than ever, we need to understand them all, how to learn, to read, and understand our history. It is only possible when we start learning to view such objects in a surprisingly global context. If we know who to look for, we can see how people from varied countries with diverse cultures, diverse cultures would inevitably communicate beyond its borders. Can I have some water? It's okay. There was, a, there was a section picturing the divine. As you, as you enter, you come across the conversation between Jesus and Ganesha. Being Indian, you feel thrilled looking at Ganesha. Oh, see, look at our Ganesha is there. Christians in India, they look at Jesus, they feel, oh, look at, Jesus is there. And there is a conversation. Deliberate, deliberately, we you know, left some surprising element for our visitors. When they come closer and read the level, then they understand the Ganesha was made in Java, and the Jesus, the European subject, was made in Goa. This part of history we need to teach. We need to share with our people. There was another interesting exhibition uh, just a couple of months ago, the Living Cathedral exhibition. And we, we created the whole church inside the museum. So people came, people saw it and appreciated. Co different communities also participated and understood. I'm just showing some of our activities. As I said, you know, one and a half million years old history you get to see here from prehistory to contemporary history. Jitish Kalath, Mohan Shamant. And this is very interesting for all of you to know and understand. Uh, recently, we created a separate space, dedicated space for children. And our curators, they decided the first exhibition will be curated by a group of children. We are not going to curate, we are not going to impose anything on our children. Then the question, how do you select future curators? So there was a competition, there were two competitions, essay writing and the drawing. And the subject was my little museum. Some kids are smart, good at writing, some are not. Some are not. 
So one of the kids, you know, uh, eight years old, he described his little museum. CSMBS Mumbai is a public-facing collection-based institute that preserves and transmits knowledge, culture, and history for the past, present, and future generations. It is probably one of the few museums in the country which is consistently collecting art objects, tangible, intangible heritage, and all immaterial elements, I, I repeat again, all immaterial elements that are less than 100 days old. The collecting practice in Indian museums need to change with the changing society because today's art will be tomorrow's past. Today, CSMBS Mumbai has become a common ground for human diversity, mutual understanding, and di diverse identities. It allows its participants to learn, reflect, and assimilate the world at their own space. It is true that the concept of museum is also evolving with time. Today, a public museum is no longer a mere repository of art and antiquity, which establishes a link between the past and the present, but an important center of culture and education that, teach, that touches all aspects of human lives. Museums of 21st century are expected to highlight the stories of people's movements, be seats of inclusion, and a platform for participants to exchange knowledge and ideas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Asia Society, for inviting me, and uh, the Getty Foundation as well for making this possible. And thanks for everyone. I actually first came in India 12 years ago as a student in Islamic art, and I'm back as a professional, as a museum, so it's quite different position here. I would like to thank you actually for this opportunity to reflect on the practice of collection, actually, of, and of collect, and it allows me to breathe a bit from my rhythm in Beirut, actually, because we, you know, keep installing, deinstalling, showing shows, and we actually don't take the time to think a lot about our strategies and our collection sometimes. Uh, I'm also happy to represent kind of the Middle East, although I don't have the pretension to do this, so if you have questions about anything else than the Sussex Museum, please try to find pe other people than me. Uh, <laughs> and I have two colleagues also from Beirut, so in any case, they can help. So I'm going to talk today about the Sussex Museum collection. Uh, it's actually a center for modern and contemporary art uh, that opened in 1961 in Beirut in an historical building uh, that dated, uh, that's the building actually, that dated back from uh, 1912. When Nicolas Rousseau passed in 1952, he donated his mansion to the citizens of Lebanon in order to create a space for the arts. It's very clear that in his will, Sursok wants this uh, house to become a museum. So he set up an independent nonprofit institution to manage the donation, planning to make an art museum that would open for all Lebanese. For most of the visitors, the status of the museum is actually quite complex to understand. The museum, whose entrance is free of charge, is a semi-public and semi-private institution, both publicly and privately funded. A 1964 law set aside 5% of tax revenue from construction permits issued by the Beirut municipality to fund the museum's operations. That law has allowed the museum to survive till today. But the museum is not considered to be subsidized by the government because the law only applies to the Beirut municipality. And despite the funding, the museum is not fully a public institution. That also kind of saves it from governmental approaches and um, obligations, maybe. It has a public mission and receives 
public financing, but it's managed by a private foundation. So the board is private, and so that it means that technically political does not interrupt any programs we do, technically. Like many, if not most, of the Lebanese cultural institutions, the museum is privately funded by private donators, sponsorships for everyday life, paint communication, insurances, etc. I will actually take one minute to go back to the Lebanese context because I think it's important here. Lebanon, as you might know, has suffered a 15-year civil war from 75 till 91, and the Siosok Museum was always open during that time, never really closed, but the activities were uh, slightly down. But the Siosok Museum was, if the Siosok Museum was at core of the artistic life before the war, it was completely absent during the tremendous cultural changes of the post-war period and not part of the discussions. These discussions were held by festival projects initiatives such, such as Ashkala Luan, the Arab Image Foundation, or the Beirut Art Center, who enabled ex experimental and engaged artistic practices. The 90s and 2000s saw the development of artistic practices that question historical narratives, but this without any institutional framework. The artist questioned national historical narratives, rewriting history and memory, confusing and blurring past and present. And in all this context, Sursok Museum was asleep during this important era, which defined what contemporary art is now in Lebanon. With the 2015 reopening of the Sursok Museum, the newly engaged team took advantage of the situation to question its mission, to go back to its responsibility, that is both to preserve and serve a collection, but also a community of artists, thinkers, makers, who need institutional support, while keeping up with the tradition of collecting. And this is quite challenging when the museum itself doesn't get any institutional support, so I may say. One of the legacies of the Sursok Museum, sorry, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had to adapt around midnight my presentation because I thought that I needed to give you more context, so yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, the day that is important is actually, yeah, for us, 2015. So I was appointed head of collection in 2014, and I, kind of unpacked the entire collection. The museum had gone through extensive renovation that lasted almost seven years, so it was, it was closed for the public, and um, no one would really know what was happening behind those walls. Actually, nothing was happening. So in 2014, when I arrived and I unpacked the entire collection, we had one mission, opening the museum in less than a year from that period. So trying to gather a team and to make a program for this museum to, um, to actually work, to be run. And from that time, this is also quite challenging because from that time, we never stopped. So that's why we sometimes don't have the time to actually think about what we're doing sometimes. So in 2015, the extensive renovation and extension of the museum defined five different exhibition spaces of various sizes, and now we hold 10 to 14 exhibitions per year. Since 2015, 46 exhibitions were opened on site, ranging from thematic group shows to solo show, from emerging artists to confirmed and pioneering pioneers of the modern art. The identity of the museum is to focus on modern and contemporary art from the region. So you will not see anything that is actually before the, the, the beginning of the 20th century, mainly. And the museum also have important collections of long-term long loans agreements. And that's the case from the example of the Fouad the Bas collection, that is a collection of photographs of 30,000 images from the Middle East, and that's a long-term loan 
in the museum. The museum fine art collection gather, gathers works from 220 different artists, mainly uh, of Lebanese origins, as well as a few foreigners who left their work over in Lebanon after an exhibition. When we reopened the museum, we had 644 items today it means four years later, and without an acquisition strategy, because I don't think we are ready yet to really question our collecting practices. And with the res as a result of the trust the museum has built over the years, we preserved the double. We preserve 1,200 works in our storages as part of the permanent collection, but we also have a little bit less than 1,000 works that are being deposited at the museum. That's a symbol of the trust people and artist estates are, are showing to us, but that's also, that's also something quite difficult and challenging to manage. That's the case, for instance, here with the Georges Com um, depot, deposit in the museum, uh, but also that comes uh, a deposit comes actually also with a donation, so we accept to do this, to take the entire uh, artist estate uh, kind of, um, but we ask for a donation as well. And uh, whatever we do in terms of like getting collections in the museum, we don't get only collections in the museum, we always get the archives as well, because we need to document. For us, it's very important to actually create content around the, the collection, the artworks in itself is not sufficient. That's the case for an, with another artist, Saida El. So the formula that we've chosen to display our collection is storytelling. That's quite new, actually. That's something that I put in place only two years, three years ago now. Um, and that's kind of a reminder that art history is not written linear, but that stories overlap, they intersect, they contradict not one another, and it needs actually to be created, to be written. This art history in Lebanon is not yet created. And what is important for us when I'm talking about the stories, I'm also talking, of, of course, about the choice of the works in our permanent collection. And on each label, usually you have the provenance of the collection as well. That's an important information for us. I'm saying this because a third of our collection actually has been constituted through something that we call the Salon d'Automne, which is um, an annual competition that museum opened with uh, since actually 61. The first exhibition of the Sussoc Museum was the Salon d'Automne, which is a, a tradition coming from France. It's this artistic manifestation coming from France, in Paris, in Paris. And you have to think that mainly the modernist artists of Lebanon have been trained in Europe, especially in France. And they are the one as well who trained over generations of uh, Lebanese uh, artists. So that's part of our archives that make actually the, the, the display possible. And that's the display. And with one other story, which is the thoughts of naive art. And you understand that archives, even archives, are exhibited in the museum. And another debate uh, in 64 on abstraction. So the archives are actually helping us to do the, the collection display. So um, the 60s and the 70s are the golden age of Lebanese modern art. And the collection is quite strong with that period. Problem is because the Sussoc Museum was totally absent of the contemporary creation and wasn't used and wasn't a public space, and Lebanon is actually lacking of public spaces, then the collection has very few contemporary artworks. So now my job is actually to try to fill the gaps between our permanent collection, trying to create a strategy of acquiring works, knowing that the Salon d'Automne is something that we still do at the museum. We did not remove this as a tradition because it's important to keep that and because the committee also had their you know, uh, word to say. But we changed the format. So it's a biennial exhibition now. 
every format, every kind of artworks can be exhibited. Technically, it means performances and whatever. It's not just the fine artwork. But also, we are collecting archives and uh, creating interviews with different artists that maybe you know. So archives are coming in the museum. We are in the process of digitizing everything to create content because the content is actually this accessibility to the, to the public, right? So that's, that's our role. And, uh, and, and mainly that's it for the permanent collection. And I'll, I will stop almost there. But I just want to say that for the rest of the spaces, because I told you we have five different spaces, for some of other spaces, the Sussex Museum try to fill also the gap and be um, a public space for other institutions in Lebanon as well. And we uh, frequently host other exhibitions or uh, participative um, festivals or projections, screenings on the, on the, on the exterior in the, of the museum. And on Thursday, we will open a new show with Ashkal Alwan, this uh, uh, institution that I've talked about. So it's not a show that we cur curate, but that they can curate in our premises. So yeah, it's uh, 14 minutes, I'm so sorry. Thank you uh, for listening and uh, yeah. Um. I mean, basically, what I was uh, going to show in my presentation, and I'll try to link it to your, to your talks, is how uh, through collection and collection building, and this answers one of the questions that we were done. I mean, should we continue collect collecting? My answer was yes. Uh, not, it doesn't have to be always physical objects. No, we can collect other things. We can collect uh, documents. We can collect instructions for artworks. Uh, things don't have to be physical, no? Uh, collecting physical objects, of course, involves uh, storage, conservation, and another series of extra, <coughs> extra steps. That's part of our responsibilities as museums and institutions to keep. But um, what I wanted to talk also and, and put as an example is uh, one, the work I've been doing at uh, Guggenheim as curator for Latin America. And, um, and how, when I was invited six years ago as part of the UBS map project, some of you might be familiar with the UBS map, there was also a South uh, Asia um, initiative, was really uh, this intention of the museum, uh, the Guggenheim, who is a museum that has locations worldwide, but wasn't a global museum, to be global, no? So how, uh, through inserting other, the work of other artists into the collection, you could create uh, new dialogues but make up for absence and uh, asymmetries. So um, when I started six years ago, there was a lot to do. No? The museum had collected a few of the grand masters of, uh, of modern Latin American art in the 60s uh, when it opened. But afterward, it hadn't done much until the 90s when it got a few of the global names of uh, which almost were not Latin American anymore, like Gabriel Orozco or Beatriz Milases, which had become global, uh, global names in the, in, the, in the artist world, into the collection. So there was a lot to do, but also a lot of gaps to fill, especially uh, works from the 70s and 80s. And, um, and the way I dealt with it, which I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting, was how do you relate these works and these artists that you're bringing into the museum in relation to the context of the museum itself and the context of New York, you know? And how to understand that the museum, the Guggenheim, uh, was built on a mining fortune. We saw somebody talk about uh, mines in Alaska, but also mines in uh, Mexico, mines in uh, Bolivia, mines in Chile. So there was a double responsibility of the museum towards Latin America. So one was the history of the museum itself towards Latin America, and the other was the history of the United States uh, towards Latin America, which is also not that dif different than the history that the states had in the past century with many of our countries, no? a, a history of, uh, of colonialism. No? So how these works that we bring into the museum uh, could, uh, could bring into spotlight this, uh, this situation no? and could speak about this complicated relationship and, um, and think of art as, um, as something that puts in friction uh, very North American, uh, European, Western collection. No? And not only in fiction, art history as itself, but I think history as, as per se. No? So, so not only the canon, of, um, the canon of art history, but also, I mean, history as, as it had been told. No? 
um, when I interviewed for the for the for the job, I presented two works, and I said, okay, if they go with this, um, I'll, I, I'll, I will be able to continue. And one was Alfredo Jarre's work that many of you know, uh, called A Logo for America, and basically he shows the map of the United States. It's a work that he showed in a billboard in Times Square in 1980, in the 1980s, and he says uh, the map of the United States is not America. He shows the map of Latin America. And he says, this is America. No? So basically changing the conception and understanding of the US American public of what America is. You know? And I think this is what we can do uh, with works and collections. You know? We can change uh, narratives, which I think is an important part of, uh, of what we can do with, uh, with, with our work. And um, so then the UBS project finished. And um, it had good things, it bad things, I think. Um, I mean, we can question a lot of, of these in initiatives, but also see the benefits that, that, it, that it brought. No? So um, basically the museum before that project had uh, about 60 something artists from Latin America. Uh, most of them, and this is not different than many museums or collections, most of them were men, uh, the, the artists from Latin America. They were whiter, no? And, um, and since I started in 2013, first with the UBS project and now uh, continuing, we've doubled that quantity, so now we have about 70 artists more. But of these 70 artists, now half of them are women. No? So these are things that we can do, that we can change within the structure of the museum, and that can ref have a reflection on society of how we're trying to change uh, society. No? So these kind of balances of power structures, maybe we cannot change the past but what we can change is the present, and this can have an impact in the future, no? And then, uh, so, so this, these things I started noticing myself, you know, I mean, the first thing when the UBS project finished, I said, um, we're not gonna, I mean, it's nice that uh, the Guggenheim did this project with Latin America, as it did with Southeast Asia and Middle East, but how are you gonna continue? Are you gonna just gonna put a check, and that's it, you know, a one night stand and continue? Or are we gonna find ways to continue, no? And, uh, and we build a small uh, group of uh, collectors who give us money each year, and with that we continue being able to purchase and bring works into the into the museum. No? It's an it's an interesting thing also because uh, I mean people think that museums are rich. No, I mean the truth is not. And in the states, I mean every everything you have to raise, all the money has to come from uh, from someone, and um, and that yes, uh, people from the United States. They get tax rebates, but many of the collectors that support us, they're from Latin America, so they're not getting nothing but, uh, but only the kind of uh, the status of, uh, or, or the happiness of being able to, to support, you know, of giving some of their extra income uh, to support the work. And uh, so in the last three years after we did the UBS map, uh, I, uh, or we, we've been trying even to be more, uh, more challenging in our kind of reading, you know, so not only uh, bringing women that were absent, uh, artists from, uh, Afro-American origin, artists from indigenous or origin, uh, queer, trans, uh, lesbian, uh, feminist discourses. So really trying to challenge through the, through the, through the collection and collection building uh, the whole kind of uh, structure of the Guggenheim's collection. But then, uh, I mean, the next thing I say is always, okay, it's great that we build, break the works in the collection, but they have no use if these works uh, are not shown, you know? And they're not shown in dialogue with other uh, works from the, from the collection itself. So, so also to remind us that this, uh, producing this dialogue, and it's something that you, that you both talked about, I think to put the works in a, in a different context and, and to spark new, new ways of thinking uh, is, is part of uh, our work of what to do with the collection. And then just the last thing, and it's something that I, get, I always tell the, the group of collectors that support us in the Guggenheim, uh, and that many of them are from Latin America. Yes, it's great that we're doing this, and it's great that we're bringing works from Latin America into the Guggenheim Museum in New York, but let's also think in reverse. No? What can we do back in our context to support the artistic scenes there, to support the museums there, um, to support artistic production? No? I mean, many of them say, I don't wanna give works to, to, a, to a national museum because uh, because I don't know what will happen to them, or in Brazil, I don't know if that museum will go on fire, or... Uh, so, I mean, these are, these are realities, you know? Uh, but maybe sometimes we think, okay, why don't you support an artist's residency? Or why don't you support a, a small exhibition in a museum to happen, you know? Which costs 
nothing, you know, it really costs nothing to do, to do something back in, back in their own countries. So we really try also to, 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 to what I call, call uh, give back, you know, or, or find ways in which things not only happen in the museums, in the center, in this case in New York, but to make things happen elsewhere and to, and to give back to the places where, where artists are working and they, and they come from. So that's basically just to talk a little bit about, about how I, I think a lot about, about what collection building. And maybe just uh, to continue this conversation, I mean, one thing, um, I think also very practical things, no? Like, uh, I mean, how, how, how do you think also yourself both about, about the power of collections? You, co you talked about the power of the object, but I would like to think also about the power of, uh, of collections and how, how we can use collections to, to change not only our, our institutions, but, uh, but to change our, our, our society, no? One, one thing we have to understand, uh, collection is the core. You cannot have a museum without collection. Now the question, you know, the power of object, the way Neil describes, object has many biographies, we have one biography. There are many lives, we have one life. We perish, they survive. That is the way we look at. Uh, collecting practices, as I, as I said uh, at, at CSMBS Mumbai, uh, we are, again, you know, in the country, we are one of the few institutes uh, collecting antiquities and art objects on a regular basis. And there are there are two systems, uh, immaterialized, uh, the word I used, you know, less than 100 years old, antiquity, art objects. If we find that they are not so important at the moment, there is a separate register we created, display accessory register. And uh, we, we have one of the members of Art Purchase Committee, uh, Mrs. Firoja Kodrej, she is there. She knows that you know, whenever we invite them uh, for the meeting and they look at something, uh, they don't look like you know, museum quality. So we say that you know, we are going to separate them. Uh, today they are not important, but tomorrow they are going to be important. And then display accessory. As display accessory, we, we purchase them. So it's a, it's a continuous process, uh, and uh, what is important that uh, you, you see that you are not leaving a gap. If we are not collecting today, if, if we stop collecting, then tomorrow is going to question us. So that is not desirable. Yep, um, you, you're saying different things, but I don't think I agree on everything you're saying right now, actually. Um, I think that the Lebanese context is uh, quite specific in, in that, that there's no history program that goes beyond the civil war, actually. The story stops in 75. After that, it's not clear what happens. That's in what, what all the education. What happened to the museum in 75? It no, it's actually the civil war starts in 75 to 91. Yeah, but the museum closed? No, the museum doesn't close. But in terms of education, all the history books uh, at school, they do st stop teaching history after that. Um, so in this context, um, we need archives, we need photographs uh, to be able to understand our history, to understand the artworks, and to rewrite our history. And I have to say, archives and photographs, they do perish. I mean, yes, we perish, and objects, you think that they are alive, but the collection we deal with, they are not alive. I mean, they, we, we are making them alive, of course, but they're going to perish at one point. And I think that's fine. I mean, I'm okay with the situation. I'm a collection keeper, so of course, collection is in the core of my reflections. But I still think that we can do a lot without collections. And anyhow, uh, you said different things as well about the question of how collection can change societies. I don't have the pretension to try to change societies. But I think that the collection, 
with the archives and the context contextualization and research helps us understanding our history and our societies and helps us writing history. Art history is not linear, at least this is something that we've seen. This is something that the museum was doing like uh, 50 years ago. They tried to do their collection displays with a linear uh, certain manner of displaying things. By creating stories, we changed that. We are creating dialogues, and one of the challenges now is to try to bring contemporary art facing modern art as well and try to fill the gaps, this very gap that is in the collection, but it, that is as well, as well in all mentalities. Um, that might sound as an anecdote, but if Lebanon is quite well known through its different communities and the kind of respect all the communities have together with all of them, and they all live in a, like right now in a, peaceful country. That's actually very controlled. Even the management of a museum is controlled by those communities and um, by our confessions, in my, if I may say. So I'm not sure the society will really change, but I think we are trying to understand, to, to write an history, and right now we are trying to confront uh, European and Occidental art to Lebanese art to rewrite this history. I mean, I mean, I, I think we always in the art world have this utopia that uh, always this belief that that we can change things. No, but uh, but I do think that uh, that if we try to be as as transparent and inclusive within the works uh, we show and inclusive, you know, I mean, in, in a museum in, in Beirut, if you include two points of view instead of only one, I think uh, people will feel more represented, you know, and, and, and you'll also make them aware of the other, you know, which, uh, which, which I, now looking at you, I, I, I really admire that you're dressed in green, you know? <laughs> I don't know if it's symbolic or <laughs> it's... Uh, it's, no, it's part of the, of the institutional message of the of the of the Sirsak, uh, of the uh, museum. Uh, doctor, would you like to talk a little bit more also? Just one thing, you know, uh, you you did ask me uh, somehow I slept uh, the power of object, and that is something we need to understand. Uh, there, is, there. Is, if you visit uh, CSMBS, uh, there is one ugly looking stone slab. You will not get attracted, but you go closer, you just start reading the label, and then you understand that ugly look is looking stone slab goes back to third century BC. The message of the first king of India, third century BC, and that India was much bigger than the present India. And what is that he is trying to convey? Because that was the time kings and emperors, they used to convey through public inscriptions. And the message was very clear. Nonviolence, peace, and tolerance. I really don't know, but last time when we did the exhibition, we brought Cyrus Cylinder from the British Museum. Cyrus the Great, he was known for human rights. But Ashoka the Great, the Indian king, he was known for human values. If I'm not wrong, these three powerful words, nonviolence, peace, and tolerance, are Indian gift to the world. So that, that message you, know, you come to know from that ugly looking stone slab, uh, it, it also talks about respect to slaves in third century BC. I have never ever come across such kind of statement. Any king or any emperor made respect to slaves. Environmental issues and all that you know you may find here and there. Yes. He talked extensively in third century BC the importance of environment, the conservation of environment. And then the last line, respect to slaves. So that is something you know we need to tell the relevance of past in the present, that is important. Our, our children, our students, they want to know the relevance, the relevance of past. And that is only possible 
through object, you narrate the story, you tell them the story. That is important, the power of the word. Thank you, doctor. Anything else you want to add? Or we open up to... Uh... No, I prefer having questions and we'll see. So if anyone has any question regarding uh, the issue around collections and how collections can uh, change our museums and institutions and society. <laughs> Uh, I'm from Taiwan. I'm the director of the National Museum of History. We have uh, more than 63,000 63, pieces of collection, including from uh, ancient Chinese uh, bronze, oracle bronze, until after the Second World War. And uh, being a director, I do pay attention to the collection. So thank you very much for the two days uh, uh, seminar. I really enjoy it, and there are a lot of ideas that inspire me and then remind me of how to do it. But uh, I want to raise the question that the collection that we focus on object, but I want you guys to talk about the system of collection. What I mean is that collection is not only focusing on the object we, we have. How about the object that we don't want and we give to other institutes, number one. Number two, is it necessary to give or establish a so-called ex uh, education of collection for the audience, our stakeholder? Because I find out this is extremely important. Last month, we find out we have four uh, Picasso's prints in our storehouse. And they are put among the uh, uh, so-called posters. And we realized that after 1963, there are kind of a system called sign and the number. And the experts suggest us these four prints are real before 1963. So we are happy to announce to the public that, hey, we got four Picasso's prints. And within two days, 60 media, including 15 TV stations, come to my office interview me. And the first question is that, how come you don't know these four Picasso prints are real? It's your fault. Explain it. And so it comes to me that the so-called education of collection is not only for staff in the museum, but it's valuable probably for the public to understand what we museum guys do inside of this museum. Now this is, uh, and a small experience that I want to share with you. Thank you. Uh, no, one, he was thanking you for your presentation. Uh, two, asking a question about uh, the accessions. I mean, how can we, can we assume, can or not, uh, decide to part with objects from the collection? In the United States, it's, uh, it's a very simple one. Uh, museums are allowed to the accession when the artist is dead. So if the artist is dead, uh, and that way it's not an offense to a, to a living artist, and if the money from that sale goes back to collection building also, or to, to, to museum uh, resources, no? so it goes back to building the, the museum. Uh, in other contexts, uh, different contexts have different, different rules. I think uh, Simam has is also a series of, uh, of uh, regulations. In order to be considered a member in a museum, you have to you have to follow them. Uh, there was a recent case in Rio de Janeiro where, where I live, where they uh, parted from a small Pollock that they had, which was a founding gift given by Rockefeller to the Museum of Modern Art in, in Rio. And it was very polemical, you know? It was, um, I mean, shall we part with the only Pollock that's in Brazil, uh, even though it's not a significant one, but it's the only one that's in Brazil? Or shall we try to sell it and uh, and with that, fund our programming for the next uh, 30 years. No? So, <laughs> so, uh, so maybe your prints uh, won't, <laughs> the Picasso prints won't, uh, but any, anything. Uh, and another was about the education, about collections. I don't know if, if anybody wants to, to add about that. Uh, only, only, only thing I, I would like to add, uh, 
Authentication process is a very complicated process, extremely complicated. And each institute is different. And the interest of each institute is also different. So some institute, you know, they focus only on modern and contemporary art. They don't look at traditional art. Uh, Multipurpose museum like us, we look at everything because we also have a natural history section. So it all depends, you know, what you want for your institute. Uh, usually in India, um, in, in uh, institutes, very few institutes are collecting antiquities and art object for your information. Uh, we, we constitute experts committee. So anything coming to the museum will be scrutinized by the committee. And now we, we have, you know, conservation center, certain, you know, scientific equipments. Uh, wherever, you know, they raise any question or any doubt, then we do the scientific analysis, and then we purchase, we acquire. So that is the way we manage things. As for us, um yeah, and it's true that uh, when you deal with a modern and contemporary collection, especially modern con collection, there are lots of fakes uh, outside. And that's partly a reason why uh, we did not create an, acquisi an acquisition committee and strategy right now, because we're not ready to deal with this yet. Uh, those debates in Lebanon are quite recent. I think that they are not... Uh, more than four years aged. So uh, these ideas of having fakes that are really coming up, uh, it's something quite new. So I think we will wait this to pass uh, before really focusing on, on, on that ourselves. Uh, we do tend to not borrow artworks from collectors that we know sell or might have fakes. So at least we try to do this because the museum should not be for us at least a platform where uh, you have uh, works that are for sale. That's something that we strongly think about it. Uh, that's it. But um, there's this, if we don't talk about collections, then that, that was this, uh, this idea uh, that, we were, what, that we had earlier today about the long-term loans and the long-term loans collection. Uh, and I think that that's, an, that's another important issue that we could raise, actually. Um, do we care the same way with these uh, uh, objects? Actually, I mean, they are, when they are in your collection, well, you, you care about them, but do you, would you have a restoration program around them? I mean, you can't do that. that they don't belong to, to your institution, right? But you want to, to, to study them, and et cetera, and et cetera. So that's part of our collecting practices that I think are right trendy right now, actually. And as for the deaccession, for now, I haven't really focused on that as well, and we didn't have really the chance. I mean, I had one once the, the, the possibility of having a collection of carpets being deaccessed de because we do have artworks in the collection that have nothing to do with, actually, modern contemporary art. And uh, since we are defining the identity of the museum as modern contemporary art, then why don't we just get rid of everything else? For me, it's part of the history of the museum. So it's part of the history of the collection. And even if it's something that I want to present, uh, I still think that it's important uh, to preserve. And maybe one day we will do an exhibition on the history of this building and on you know, everything else than the mission of the museum. So I think it's important to keep that, at least for now. <laughs> Um, I would add to the idea of uh, authentication in the in the United States. Also, a lot of artists, states, and a lot of experts are preferring not to to declare works authentic because of fear of being sued. You know, so that's also a big issue uh, against something being real or not. As some museum uh, one tries to when we acquire works. I mean, you you do review provenance, you, you try to be sure that you know the history of the work, that where, where it's coming from, where it has been shown. We also basically like to think of the idea that we're uh, selecting one of the best works of the artists and that, um, and that these works are coming uh, into, into, into the collection, no? so, so that there's a, a whole history. Uh, one more question before uh, we, we heard the bell uh, warning us, but I think if anybody want, has one last question, I think we can do it.
I want to ask a question regarding uh, digital archive of Lebanon Museum. Uh, because you emphasized how it's important for you to create this archive. Uh, what are you doing now with this archive? Uh, do you have a, a digital platform uh, where public uh, can have access for these materials? Do you share this archive with the other bigger uh, international archives, like for example, Asia Art Archive does? I'm not sure it has an interest for Asia Art Archives, although we, we know them. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm coming from a background as well where I was the manager of a private, a private photographic collection before coming up at the Sosak Museum. So I had to deal with a collection of photographs that we tried to digitize actually with, with my friend and colleague that is just sitting here. And uh, digitization started with this collection uh, through a grant from the British Library. Now, the Sussex Museum has uh, an history of, of course, of its collection and of its archives. But, um, so when it opens in 61, with the Salon d'Automne and all those exhibitions, of course, archives were produced. They were produced, I mean, they were gathered. And they were put on a corner, and that's it. They were not used, not accessible, and, and that's it. So. What we have now is the archives of the museum since the 60s, meaning all the press cuts, the artist folders that are archives in becoming. We are producing archives as well. We are trying to do interviews with the artist, gathering documentation whenever they give us documentation of their exhibitions. So there are at least, at least we have like three to four types of archives. The ones of the museum, the, of the history of the museum, and these are uh, really part of a program that is uh, digitization and accessibility. That's unfortunately just accessible at the museum, in the library museum for now. And, and, and that's going quite fast actually. Once we are done with this, we will target other archives. But we have the archives of the artist folders and of the artist estates. So whenever we get a donation or a long-term agreement, what we do is that we digitize for them and we Either we give them the copy of the, of, the, of the archives, or we give them back the original and we keep the copy to make everything accessible in the museum, but in the library. For now, this is the way it works for research purpose. Uh, so you'll have to come to Beirut if you want to do some research. But it's possible as well. I've been working with different persons at, in AMCA uh, and uh, scholars who are actually doing research on the Middle East uh, artworks. And um, because we know them as well, we are sending really huge retransfer files and we are digitizing archives just for their own projects. So upon special request, we're doing this. And uh, for the platform, no, it's something that we, we've been trying to discuss uh, at the very beginning of, of the opening of the museum. My director was the director of the Arab Heritage Foundation for 17 years and I think she got fed up with platforms and databases, so it's gonna go back on the table, I think, in the, in the next years, but for now we are trying to understand what we have and what, are, what will be our fields, and because we are so tiny team, we'll think about who can do this and with which support as well. Anything that you want to add? Uh, we, we started digitization in 2013. Uh, we could not complete the entire collection uh, it's about uh, 100,000 antiquities and art object, hoping against hope uh, in next five years we complete. And then we upload the entire collection, that is the whole idea, on the website. At the moment you get to see few, about 400, 500 objects, and then every three months we change, and then another 500 we upload. Uh, low resolution, uh, low res images, uh, and anybody can, you know, download, uh, because original is with us, you can use the photograph, there is no, no issue, but it is very much there. Yeah, I would like to add also the, the problems, and that would be a whole other topic of conversation, of conserving digital works, and, uh, and how works that uh, were made uh, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that technologies that made them uh, don't exist today. 
including video works, media works. So, I mean, sometimes a stone that was made 2,000 years can continue to carry a message that maybe a work 30 years ago uh, is, 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 erased, is, is, is disappearing, no? So it's something that, uh, that is becoming urgent, no? How to keep our recent memory, no? Our conversations, you know? Email conversations about building an exhibition that were done on the Hotmail platform. They've disappeared, you know? Uh, conversations that you had in my space, you know? They're not there anymore. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, me me recent memories that are disappearing that we should also think about, I mean, how, how, how are we gonna deal with this? With this, uh, we end our conversation. Thank uh, our great panelists. Uh, and thank you, everyone. for. Uh,